Good morning. We're actually in the uh, Grenache block at Mount Mary property. I'm here with Sam Middleton. Looks like it's row number 359 in Grenache 2. We'll ask what that is in a minute. Uh, but we thought we, as part of the release of the new Marley Russells, uh, we'd come out to the vineyard this morning, just have a look around and then maybe taste the wine. Sam, when was <coughs> this vineyard planted, this part that we're standing in now, and why was it planted? So we first um, planted the Mali Russell varieties in 2008 yep. um, and we planted seven Southern Rhone varieties back then. So um, the reason why we chose this particular spot for the Grenache is we actually isolated or identified this spot on the property as being the warmest site. Yep. Uh, north facing and it's just a little, um, its own sort of mesoclimate I guess um, you'd say right here. Um, yep and obviously Grenache being one of the later ripening varieties that we have, yep. uh, we thought it would benefit from this warmer site. Yeah, the decision to plant, I mean the main, the original Mount Mary vineyard is down the hill back over there. Um, what was the, the decision around this Rhone project as it were? Um, thinking about the original varieties there, planting some new things, where was that coming from originally? Um, we started sort of thinking about this project in the mid 2000s yep. uh, and it, it was I guess sparked by uh, this notion that we're picking varieties so much earlier nowadays than we have over the last 30 or 40 years. So vintages, ha vintages have come forwards um, and this sparked our interest in thinking, okay, well, let's start thinking about what varieties are well suited to a warming climate, a drying climate, um, and let's have a bit of fun with what, what could, can we possibly grow on this site. Uh, I guess that's how the whole thing started and thinking about the next generation every decision we make at Mount Mary is absolutely for the long term yep. um, and we want to be planting varieties that we think are going to be here for the next 30, 40, 50 years. What about the clones of the Grenache? What have you got here? So we've got, uh, good question, we've got yeah. G G6 and G2 so okay. um, they both come from uh, Yolumba. Uh, and we just wanted, basically it was a real trial and error yep. type of approach in the early days. Yep. So um, we had room to put, put two different clones and um, fascinating to see just how they ripen differently. So G2 here, as you referred to in the introduction, ripens a lot later than G6. And in terms of what goes into like this year's wine, the, the 20, 2018 RP2 that we're releasing, um, what's the mix in that one? We'll, we'll look at it later, but in terms of the varieties, what else is in there? So we've got Grenache, Shiraz, Morvedra and Cinso. Yep. Um, and when we kind of um, started talking about the project back in the mid 2000s, we wanted it to be quite Grenache dominant. Yep. Uh, and looking back over the last sort of 10 years of, of growing these varieties now, uh, we're so glad that that was the approach because it, it really does make fa fantastic, fascinating wines. Um, grows really well in this valley and I think we're gonna see more and more Grenache planted here in the Yarra in the future. Just over your shoulder there, it seems like there's a big body of water. That's new, and that's uh, that's uh, filled just rainfall, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's exciting. Uh, so that that actually, um, it was dug sort of. It started it started to be dug November last year. Um, my dad, David Middleton, is a it's a conservationist at heart, and this was more of a, a wetlands project rather than um, a source of irrigation. You can see that we've got no drippers in our vineyard, and the whole vineyard's been established um, in a dry grow and fashion and that's something that we want to try and hang on to but um, yeah we're going to turn that into a bit more of a, a wetlands area and, a, and hopefully attract some some bird species and other um, animals that used to be here that, that that have currently sort of left and we want to bring them back into the fold right so things have progressed a long way since 1971 um, what would Dr. John think of all this? I think he'd be impressed. He was always an ambitious man. Well, you, we're never quite sure what Dr. John would think of other people's ideas, but I think basically when we when we decided to plant the Rhone varieties, we my, my father bought this block which attaches to our old vineyard. It's a south-facing slope as opposed to a north-facing slope, and it's given us a lot of flexibility to be able to move varieties around and try and really pinpoint exactly um, the perfect spot for, for individual varieties. Sustainability is quite a thing here now, isn't it? It's huge, yeah. It's, it, it's something that I guess the, well, the second and the third generations now are, are really passionate and interested in. Um, and we want to, I mean, it's, it's, it's a buzzword at the moment, but I, I think in a lot of ways it, it needs to be. And um, we're certainly trying to move into a more uh, organic, sustainable approach to, to viticulture. We're going to go and taste the new Marley Russell wines while we're here this morning. Why are they called Marley Russell, for those who may not know? So it was named after my grandma. Um, Russell was her maiden name and 
my grandfather John was very headstrong in his opinions and beliefs and um, would often tell us that if we ever veered away from just making the full Mount Merry wines that the whole thing would go belly up so we thought it was unfair to name it after him. Marley was very uh, more open-minded to the next generation and new ideas and, and I guess being a little bit more uh, innovative yep. so to speak. Yep. <laughs> And they've certainly gone well. This is what the third release in now, is it third or fourth? Uh, this is so the first ones we bottled were in 2014. Yeah, uh, we played around with some wine in 13 but didn't bottle anything. Um, and it's just been a super exciting project for us because these are wines that uh, they don't have a reputation, it's a clean slate from a winemaking point of view. Um, we're learning as we go, absolutely, and we just want to see gradual progression and improvement in everything that we're doing from a bit of cultural point of view but also from, from a winemaking point of view. So um, yeah, it's, it's an opportunity to, to try new things and, um, yeah. Talk me into it. Let's go and taste some wine. <laughs> uh, okay, well, we're here in the, this is the old, this is part of the original winery. It is. Uh, yeah. Not many people get the chance to come into this little sneaky little room. Uh, quite a few barriques and a lot of large format old stuff um, as well. So we're going to try the two new wines. Um, now they're called RP. We're not allowed to say Rhone Project, are we? Because it's we couldn't possibly associate the word Rhone with this. So they're called RP. Just let that one go through. Here. <laughs> so uh, we're going to do the, the white wine first. Talk to us about the white wine, and we'll we'll taste together on camera, as it were, and see if it's any good. What do you reckon? Yeah, no, that sounds good. Patrick. So I, I guess the first thing to probably say is that all these seven varieties were actually. Um, plan to go into one wine. Yep. So when we planted the Seven Southern Road rugs in the vineyard, we wanted to make a Chateau Neuf sort of style and have all the reds and the whites in together. We fermented everything separately and kept everything separately, separate in the first year and just thought that the white had too much potential to be a standalone wine. We just didn't want to blend it away into the red. Plus the red was already quite a light aromatic style anyway. I just didn't feel like it could handle that amount of white. So we saw a great opportunity to keep the white and the red separate. Yep. Um, so yeah, so back to this blend. So it's, this particular blend is 45 uh, Marsan, 45 Roussan, and 10% Claret. Claret's an interesting one. There's not that much of that used in Australia. What does that bring to it, do you think? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really interesting, intriguing variety for me. It's yeah. one that certainly I'm learning so much about and continuing to, to learn about, but it's, it's, it grows quite tight, lean, um, relatively acidic wines, but it's the phenolic structure I think that sets it apart from the other two. It's a very phenolic variety, it's got quite a thick skin, um, and it gives a real limey, citrusy sort of character to the, to the blend. Yeah. We talked a lot about these sorts of varieties, obviously we've worked with you people for a long time, and the, the guys over the hill at Yeringberg as well, and these, these styles of wines, um, and looking at that in the glass, and that's only the second time I've seen it, it's just such a lovely drink in terms of drinkability. There's lots of flavour, lots of nuanced textures, um, good acidity. It's taut, it's mineral, but it's actually got some um, generosity as well. And you can see that it would appeal to tasters of all sorts of wines. Yeah, I think, I mean, we've spoken about, about, about this a lot together, and we want to make these Marley Russell wines in a Mount Mary style. We want them to look like um, they're from Mount Mary. Um, in, in terms of the way that they drink, but we still want them to reflect the really interesting characteristics of, of these varieties. Yep. Um, and that's the sort of line that we're walking down. So, you know, in, in this case, I think it's probably a little bit tighter and leaner than what some drinkers would expect from a more traditional Rhone um, wine from, mm -hmm. from these varieties. But I still think when you taste this wine, you do think Mount Mary. Um, and that's really important to us. It's probably the hardest thing to achieve, isn't it, to have to not have a winemaking thumbprint all over it. You want it to have a house style, you want it to have a family resemblance, but you want the winemaking guys to sit in the background. And the the vineyard, I mean, what we're getting at here is a new a new interpretation of what a Mount Mary wine tastes like. Yeah. A new expression of. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah hundred percent. Of course we are using the uh, Jancis Robinson stems, these um, <laughs> These glasses were here when Jancis came out here. When was that? Was that a year ago? No, late last year. Late last year. Yes. She was here yeah. Doing a tasting. Yeah. Very intriguing. And of course, served at a lovely cellar temperature. Thank you for that. 
Yeah, and I think that's just so important for this wine in particular. Yeah. Um, I mean, we say this about all our whites, but um, it should never be served too cold. I think it, it really mutes and, and just kills that aromatic profile of this wine. It's quite a delicate, restrained wine. And I think 12, 13 degrees is the perfect temperature to really be enjoying it. Just on winemaking, so what do we do with the three varieties? How, how is it assembled? How long? Yeah, so like we, we said in the vineyard, we're, we're still learning about the way that we want to make these wines in the winery and we're still playing around with things. So in the first year we actually fermented it on skins yep. um, because we wanted to try and get a little bit more phenolic and texture into the wine. And then we decided, no, it just wasn't quite working from that point of view of looking like a Mount Mary style, but also trying to make the wine that we wanted to make. Um, we prefer to get that phenolics from the press. Yep. So we run pretty long press cycles um, to give the juice a bit of skin contact time just within the press. We press reasonably hard to extract that little bit more phenolic, I guess. Um, kept separately because they're ripening at different times and we really want to pick these at optimum ripeness levels. So um, staying separate in the winery and then really just following the way that we make Mount Mary White. So, uh, press to tank, left for 24 to 48 hours to settle, and then we rack kind of and take two thirds of the leaves with us. So really just leaving that layer of um, you know, dirt that's on the outside of the berries at the bottom of the tank and taking everything else um, with us. Juices straight to barrel. Uh, some, sometimes we inoculate and sometimes we're wild. So we're still playing around with different yeasts and, and trying to work out um, exactly what works best for, for this one. Great. Let's have a look at the red. So of the, of the red varieties, Grenache has really been the star performer in terms of how things have evolved? Yeah, I think so. It's sort of, I mean, it's the, it's the biggest percentage in the wine, but it sort of leads, leads the charge in terms of defining the style of the wine. So um, I want this wine to have a really nice level of juiciness and, and primary fruit, but I also want it to have that spicy, savoury um, sort of complexity or component to it. And, that's what the Grenache brings. It, it's this kind of really juicy fruit, but it's also got a savoury, spicy element, um, you know, I guess due to that, that slightly cooler climate, not that you can't make that style in warmer climates as well, mm. but, um, and we're seeing a, a lot more of this more restrained style of Grenache being, making, being made right around the, the country. Um, so yeah, the, the Grenache has been a, you know, a big part of the blend, and then you've got Shiraz, which Shiraz is you know, obviously been grown in the Yarra for a long time and uh, really has a proven track record of, I think, in this in this valley, makes some fantastic wines. And we want that Shiraz just to bring a bit more weight to the mid palate of this wine. That, that, that's what it's about. We know we can get Shiraz to a really nice ripeness level in most years. Um, and we talk about Shiraz, it's, it's not really a late ripener in our, in our vineyard, you know, it's, it, it comes in a lot, um, well, it comes in before the, the quintet varieties anyway. So that's never been a real issue in terms of ripeness. The Morvedra is uh, one that I'm learning a lot more about as well. We've, we've learned that we have to drop a lot of fruit to get the result um, that we want in the vineyard. Um, and that brings that kind of more brooding, not necessarily um, weight, but the flavour profile is a darker, deeper profile. And that, that gives, I think, a bit more earthiness to yep. the blend as well. Yep. The Stinso, is probably the hardest one to get right in the vineyard. Um, it grows ginormous bunches, huge berries, um, and it's very important from an aromatic point of view. Um, and I don't want to be, I, don't, I want to be careful not to put too much in because I think it can drag the palate weight of the wine back too much, but it's really important aromatically and I think it gives this blend a real uniqueness. There's certainly a lot of um, highly charged aromatics jumping out of the glass, you know, it's um, it's quite sort of autumnal forest floor in a way. There's all that blood plum, uh, bright strawberry fruits, very pure, very fine. Um, it's really alluring and as, a, as a young wine, quite a charming wine already. Yeah, and that was one of the um, thoughts behind this whole project. We want these wines to be quite approachable in the youth. They're not wines that you have to keep in your cellar 10 or 15 years before um, you know, they start showing their uh, potential. We want these wines to be looking um, really nice, fruit forward, drinkable wine straight at release. Um, so that's, that, that's 
we hope, part of the style. Well, well done. I think they're an awesome pair this year. I think it's been a progression. I think these are the, the strongest pair so far, I think, in terms of the Marley Russell story. And um, if you want more information about these wines, you can head to our website, sellerhand.com.au or at Sellerhand Wine on any of the social channels. And these wines are effectively being released now, so contact your local Sellerhand friendly person. And uh, cheers. Cheers, Sam. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Patrick.